those of you tuning in on the stream, we love you. God bless you. Let's get into the word this morning. Amen. If you'll glance down at your Bible with me for just a moment, let's remember where we have been so we can study right where we are. But we learned a lot in chapter 8 thus far. One of the many things that we've learned is how God can use one single person, one. And he sent out many at this time in the early church. You know why. We've covered that. But just one person, Philip, God can use one person to do really anything. The incredible work that he wants to do, and that is saving souls that are separated from him, saving souls that are destined to go to an eternal hell. That is God's desire. And just one person, one person he can send out and do anything through. We've seen that with Philip. And I pray this teaching, as it's intended to, reminds us and inspires us that there's really nothing more important for us as children of God the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, than to do as maybe we just did. Here am I, Lord, send me. What do you want to do through me? Listening, watching, waiting, and then going when he says go. We're going to celebrate that again this morning. Part two with Philip here. Guys, it's one thing to read this. It's a whole other thing to experience this, isn't it? Talk about growth, and we talk about faith, and we talk about kind of all these themes as we should in church. It's not a spectator sport. We can follow the example of those who have wisely gone before us and experienced the very same things that they did, they did. That's why this is here. To appreciate them, sure, but to participate in the, the history, the legacy of the church, that's what you're a part of. And that's what we get to experience. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Amen? We cl- one person agrees. Thank you so much. God bless you. Love you. But we closed our study, verse 25, last week with this commentary. So we'll jump right back here. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, this is Peter, this is John, this is Philip too, kind of wrapping up the ministry in Samaria. That is officially a church has been planted, no doubt leaders appointed. Most Bible students agree that it was only Peter and John that left. Philip stayed in this place at that time. Whether that's true or not, the Lord knows. But here we're, we're wrapping up this focus on this particular place. The work continued, but our attention is going to continue uh, to be focused on the life, the story of Philip. So again, verse 25, Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans as, as it were on the way. And now verse 26, we'll pray, but we get to cover again in the life of Philip, this second sending, if you will, the second time he heard the voice of the Lord, received a message from the Lord and went out into the work of the Lord. And before we do, this gets me and I'd love to talk for about three hours on it. I won't. But this time, thank you. God bless you. This time the Lord doesn't send him. God just sent him to a city, but a whole people group. And we talked about that, right? Fantastic. But the Lord now is going to send him to one person. One person. Because a single soul is so precious and dear to the heart of our Lord. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you blessed to remember and to share that this is the God that we serve? One soul is so precious and so valuable to him that he'll send a, a hot shot. He'll send a Philip, right? This guy's coming off a big win, as it were. He's got some notoriety and fame hanging with Peter and John and the big boys. I'm kidding. But come on, let's, let's apply a little contemporary reality to this. He's sending to one guy, one guy, Philip. And it's radical and miraculous, and we'll get into it shortly. That's the God that we serve. The one who leaves the 99, they're okay, they're healthy, they're safe. But he'll leave the 99 to go after just one. Why? Because that's who our God is. That's what he does. And so too, I want to remind you this morning, that's the kind of church you attend to if this is your home. Um, A lot's going on in these last days. And when your heart is broken, when your life is falling apart, when you have questions and you're being threatened, and whatever the case may be, Please don't forget 
This isn't the, the happy plastic people club, right? Where we pretend everything's okay. But you have shepherds here that will tend to you and bless you, just you, just by yourself. We don't care if anyone knows. They generally don't because we don't do it for them. We do it for you. And when you reach out, someone will be there. Amen? That's who our Lord is. That's his heart. One single seeking soul, just one. And he sends Philip to minister to him and to tend to him. And so all that being said, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful text. Speak to us today. Holy Spirit, we want to yield our lives, open our hearts, open our ears and hear what you would say to us today. The goal is that we would simply be more like Jesus, that we'd grow, that we'd mature, that the church would be raised up into service. Love and good works, God help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's agree together. Amen. I heard you at home. Thank you. I heard you at home. I'm just kidding. Verse 26, let's read. Continuing on in our story, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, read it with me, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem. You can look in a map in the back of your Bible if you have that to Gaza. There are two roads that go down through this area. The Lord tells Philip to take the one, go to the one that's rarely used, seldom used, not the main highway, but an offshoot as it were. Luke tells us here, because he's writing, this is a desert place. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Pause and think it through for just a minute. And yet, verse 27, what do we read? Philip rose and went. Our first thought here, if you'll write it down, Philip listened to the Lord and what? Obeyed. It's on the screen. Philip listened to the Lord and obeyed. And you can fill in the blanks here. Again, most Bible students believe he's still in Samaria, and yet he hears the voice of the Lord through this angelic messenger. Maybe he's spending some time in prayer. We see that often in the Scripture. We know when God speaks, it's because someone's listening. And so Philip was listening, most likely in prayer. We see this a lot. Angel appeared, says, this is what God wants you to do. And even though it didn't make a whole lot of sense, Philip simply rose and went. He obeyed. Philip left a, a thriving ministry. He's the pastor of the, of the city, of the region, of a people, as it were. Such a successful outreach and signs and wonders and miracles and all the rest. And yet he immediately left for no real good reason, practically speaking, but for the most important reason that anyone will ever do anything, and that's because God told me to. Philip, why are you leaving? It doesn't make any sense. What you're doing, I don't understand. This is what the Lord told me to do, so that's what I'm going to do. Go walk out into the desert, the middle of nowhere. I'm not going to tell you why. Do what I tell you to do. That's how the Lord speaks to us even still today. Often, and write this down because it's important, one step at a time. Well, Lord, why am I going there? That's not for you to know. Silence. Have you ever asked the Lord why? Silence. I've told you what to do, now do it. That's what we see with Philip here. Step two doesn't come until step one was done. Do you see that here? And you will. Philip, go. Philip, obey. Why am I going? What are you going to do? After all, the work here is going great and aren't I needed? Silence. Do what I told you to do. Right? Philip's you know, a big deal now. And yet, he remembers that he's still simply a servant of the Lord. And a servant of the Lord, boy, serves. Lives to please his master. Obeys. And write this thought down if you would. Obeying the Lord was all that mattered to fill up. Obeying the Lord. And that's all, frankly, that should matter to us. And so I love that, verse 27, he simply did what the Lord told him to do. God spoke, and Philip did it. 
And that led to greater and more glorious things. But it works the same way for us. You know, people often say, I I want to know what the will of God is for my life. I wish I knew what the will of God was for my life. And oftentimes we want to know so we can evaluate whether or not we're going to do it. I want to know the five-year plan, God, the 10-year plan. Why are you doing what you're telling me to do? Uh, I, I hear that you're saying one thing, and maybe it's this, go. But I want to know what life is going to be like and where I'm going to head and so on and so forth. And you get silence. And so oftentimes there's stillness. We sit still. We don't go. We don't do because we're waiting for God to lay the whole thing out before us. You guys, I pray you know by now. That's not how it works. One step at a time. Can you say that out loud, please? One step of obedience at a time. That's what we see in the scripture. Old Testament and new, and certainly with Philip here. God did not speak again until Philip obeyed step one. Right? can be hard, it can be difficult, but that's the key for me, to obey that one thing. And then more info Additional steps will come. I was remembering this week early on in in life for us, that is Bonnie and I, um, we were on staff, you know, serving in a church, and the Lord said, go. He didn't say why. He didn't say where. He just said, go. That's a tough thing to hear. Well, God, why? Silence. But he said, go. It's time to step out. It's time to go. We didn't know why. We couldn't say what, right? But a few months after that, we, we found the what, and we learned the why, and that got us up to Sacramento, and a few years later, here we are, right? It's just that simple, but listen, it's one single step at the time, uh, at, 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 at a time, pardon me. But think that through for just a minute, practically our point. What else in life, and that is this Christian life, what else do we have in this Christian life if we don't have obedience What is this that we're doing? What is this that we're a part of? We call Jesus our king, and rightly we should, and our Lord, and rightly we should. But if we don't do the things that he says, then why call ourselves a part of this, this thing called Christianity at all? And Jesus expresses those words. Why do you call me Lord and not do the things that I say? Something's wrong here. Something's broken. Something's out of place. It's not your job or mine to evaluate the why, but to do the what. Amen? We do things today culturally that biblically are condemned. We evaluate our Christianity by how passionately we worship. Where do you see that in the scripture? And Lord, and all the the show and the song and the dance, and sometimes there's banners and sign language and and dancing, and we're these intense, outward, physical worshipers, and we think, well, boy, I'm a super Christian because that's how I worship. Or maybe it's how we give. Well, I give a lot, and so isn't that enough to God? No, and he expressly says that in his word. It's our heart. It's simply our obedience. Another good word is allegiance. People don't like that word these days, but it's appropriate. It's perfect. I choose the Lord's side every time. That's what I want to be on. When was the last time, Christian, that you heard the voice of the Lord, you did it? I'm not judging you. I'm just challenging you. I hope you know what that's like. This is what I want you to do. Okay. And then step two and step three and step four. But life is flying by, isn't it? Only one life to live, right? Just one. You can't go back. You can only move forward. So let's do that. The only things that are going to last from this life is, again, those things that we do for the Lord. So how much more important in how many ways can we make the same point? Obedience is the key. Someone said this, if Christ is hindered, it is because some Philip is not willing to go. God help us, amen? So verse 27, we continue, Philip rose and went. Simple, but so beautiful, right? Quintessential Christianity. 
Now we begin to see the rest of the story, and it's beautiful. Philip rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, just a title, who was in charge of all her treasure. This is a very important guy, right? High-ranking official, ruled and dispensed the treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, sitting in his chariot, and he was reading, no doubt, aloud, as they did at that day at that time, reading aloud the prophet Isaiah. And as Philip was off in, in the distance, the Spirit said to Philip, Psst, I love this, go over and join this chariot. Our second point, things we can learn from our brother Philip. Philip trusted the Holy Spirit and took a risk. Philip trusted the Holy Spirit and took a risk. Historically, you can look into these things. When the Queen of Sheba went to visit Solomon, she went back with, some would say, uh, the fear of the Lord and understanding of the one true God, the God of Israel. And lots of cultural things took place in Ethiopia over the years from that time. But here we see some of the fruit, don't we? Here's a guy in a high-ranking official in this monarchy seeking the Lord, goes to the place where he knows the Lord is or was to hear from him, to find him, to seek him, probably leaves with a scroll of Isaiah. Probably didn't go there with it. And that's a profound thing. These are very rare and very expensive and so on and so forth. This guy's seeking the Lord. He goes to Jerusalem, but the sad thing is this. He didn't really find God, did he? But he's about to. So fill in the blanks and get the picture. This is so very beautiful. This guy's seeking after the one true God, and God ensures that this man finds him. Now we're beginning to see how important each and every single step is, right? And how one thing leads to another. And so Philip, he sees him, and the Spirit says this, go over and join this chariot. This is a big deal. Remember who this guy is. High-ranking official, he's got soldiers and bodyguards. He oversees the treasury. So they got the bazookas and the armored vehicles. I mean, think, think through who this guy is. And, and here comes Philip. Hey, he's running, trying to overtake them. And that's exactly what we're about to read. He could be viewed as a threat. He could very easily catch a spear or an arrow, because why risk it, right? So Philip took a risk. He trusted the Lord and just did what God told him to do. He didn't view this situation naturally and, and was afraid but he viewed it supernaturally, and he obeyed. Everybody needs Jesus, and God wants everybody to come to him through Jesus and be saved. Amen? VIPs and royalty and noteworthy people and all the rest, everybody needs Jesus. We live in the days of, man, rock stars and and business moguls and supermodels and all these silly things. But I tell you, a, a Christian who daily sits at the feet of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who basks in his glory and experiences his holiness, his presence, man, we shouldn't be afraid to approach anybody. Why be intimidated? Oh, I just know you. Oh, you, you, you. Oh, you. This person and that person, I'm just so, oh. Why would a, a Christian such as, as this Ever be intimidated, afraid, silenced, affected by, distanced by, uh, wow, these earthly kind of idolatry-based nonsense. It should never be the case. So Philip didn't let it be the case. He pushed past the guards. He ran. He approached. He risked his life, as it were, and just ran up alongside this guy and yelled out to him as this caravan is moving. Someone said, we often shrink back from speaking boldly about Jesus, and the world lets us know we shouldn't talk about such things. But the world does not hesitate to impose its own message on us. We should be just as bold to the world about Jesus as the world is bold to us about sin. Oh, so this is that kind of forum. Okay, well then, here's my particular 
viewpoint on things as long as we're sharing, right? Not afraid, not intimidated by any person, by any position, but simply doing what the Lord calls us to do when he calls us to do it. And that is key, isn't it? Submitted to the voice of the Spirit, listening sensitively to what he might say. And whether it's Peter, you know, grabbing the guy by the hand, that was intense. Silver and gold I don't have. Get up here, buddy. And he grabs this lame man. I sure hope Jesus heals him, right? And, and he did. Or whether it's Jesus, and think through some of the miracles. Jesus made mud out of dirt and saliva, put it on a guy and healed him. This blind man could see. That's weird. That's different, right? But as the Lord speaks, that's what we do. Period. Run and overtake this chariot. That's crazy. That's Christianity, folks. God help us to listen and obey. So hearing from the Holy Spirit and trusting him is key, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> I hope you got me on this one, Lord. All right, I'll do it. I'm not going to explain it away. I'm not going to shy away. I'm going to do what the Lord is calling me to do. Amen. Verse 29, again, the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Overtake it is what it really means in the original language. And so, no complaining, no groaning out of Philip. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, in picture this, he's like jogging alongside. This is crazy, this is weird. It's awesome. Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? Unless what? Oh, God help us. Someone helps me. Someone guides me. Andy's going to talk about that. And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Well, Lord, how's he going to, and is it going to happen, and how could it be? And just do what the Lord tells you to do and trust him for the details. This is unheard of. This is miraculous and all the rest. It's supernatural, and that's what it is to serve the Lord. Number three, and I'm done. Philip harvested the Holy Spirit's ministry, didn't he? That's what we forget. That's why we're so often faithless and tempted to just not do that one thing the Lord calls us to do. Well, I've got to, you know, set it up from beginning to middle to end and A to Z and this person, I don't know them and they don't know me. Listen, God's already been working there. For years and probably decades, how long had God been working on this man's heart to get him, again, Ethiopia and all the way up to Jerusalem and kind of disappointed, bought a scrolls, coming down and, and, and riding back. And how, how long had God been working in this man's life, cultivating a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, right? Cultivating this, this thirst for living water. Do you know what that is? What Jesus offered that Samaritan woman at the well, living water, creating and cultivating and, and nurturing that thirst in this man for the things of God. And so here Philip is, right moment, right time. We get to kind of rake it all in. We get to experience the, the blessing. And God is so good to us in that way. We're simply entering his field of work. Stuff's ripe. It's right there. It's ready to be plucked and, and for, for hearts to be surrendered. It's all there. We just have to get up and go. What did Jesus say? In regard to the Samaritans, after that story, the woman at the well, and the fields are ripe to be harvested. Pray to God, the Lord of the harvest, that he can send out laborers into the fields. All we do is this. Pluck, gather, collect, because God's already laid it out. May that build and stir some faith in us today. We're not beginning this from scratch. We're entering out into the field of which God is already at work. Think this through as we transition. It's just that first step, isn't it? What will you do when the Lord calls you? You sit here this morning. You hear his voice, your daily devotion. And he says, Psst. We explain it away. Will you say, oh, that wasn't the Lord? Yes, it is. Just one step. Will you say, Lord, show me the rest? He won't do that. 
or will you obey him? Lost souls like this are, are at stake. God has prepared the field. Obedience is all that matters. Will you simply go? Will you simply do? This is your heritage as a Christian. This is your legacy. This is the church ministry. This is who and what God has called us to do and be. Lord, help us. Amen? All yours, buddy. Amen. Look at me with uh, uh, verse 32. It says, Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his, humilia in his hum humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth, right? And so Philip, you know, he's gone through a lot in the past couple of chapters, right? You know, the death of his friend, persecuted uh, uh, by Saul and by others, right? People are being imprisoned, driven out of Jerusalem, right? And had to go to Samaria, a place where most people didn't want to go, right? And yet the Lord used him mightily and not just to minister to a city, but to minister to just one individual. And as was just said, you see the spirit uh, opening doors and setting Philip up for success in, in the passage that he's reading. It's Isaiah 53. And for those of you that, that aren't aware, Isaiah 53 is one of the most powerful Old Testament prophecies about the life and the ministry and the crucifixion uh, uh, of Jesus, right? And so Isaiah 53 verse 5 is a different verse that's not in this uh, particular description, but it says this was part of the scroll, right? And it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And so the passage itself is talking about a God's suffering servant and how he takes upon the sins of us, right? And, and takes it upon himself, and so I've just got three observations about what Philip is doing here and what we can learn uh, from these actions. Uh, firstly, we see this. Philip shared the word. Philip shared the word. Uh, Philip goes to the word to preach the gospel, to share with the Ethiopian man uh, Jesus. And he interprets the word. He interprets it correctly, right? The Bible isn't just a collection of isolated proverbs and cute sayings that you you know, post on Instagram, right? It's this large, beautiful tapestry uh, that points to Jesus. It's made up of narratives, of poems, of prophecies, all of it pointing to this, this, this uh, pivotal moment in, in the Gospels in which Jesus dies for our sins and is raised to life three days later. And Scripture makes that clear. Uh, Luke chapter 24, Jesus is speaking to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And in verse 26 and 27, he says this, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he began to explain to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, right? And so uh, all of scripture points to Jesus. And so Philip takes this moment to to interpret Isaiah 53 in such a way that, that glorifies Christ, as was in his, its intended purpose. Uh, but also, too, we see the importance of those who teach the Bible, right? Do you understand what you're reading? You know, how can I? How can I unless someone guides me, right? Whether it be the Holy Spirit, a teacher, right? Uh, someone to uh, explain the word uh, uh, to him. And I want to make this clear. Teachers and pastors don't have the monopoly on spiritual understanding, right? We're just humans uh, that, that read the Word and listen to the Spirit and share what He's speaking to us. Uh, but God has given us fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to point to Him, to pour into each other, right? To share with each other what the Lord is speaking to us through the Word. In that way, iron sharpens iron. There's accountability, right? The Ethiopian man could have read Isaiah 53, like, oh, you know, I think it means this. It just starts grabbing stuff in the depths of his mind and, and make things up. And it sounds silly to us, but it happens all the time. It happens all of the time, right? 
Acts 18, and, and, and this is a kind of a, a, a reference to what I'm talking about here. There's this guy, his name's Apollos. He's a native of Alexandria. In verse 24, it says he came to Ephesus. He was eloquent, competent in scriptures. In verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, these are two Christians, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately, right? So apparently, you know, he already knew his stuff to a degree. He was, you know, eloquent, he was competent in the scriptures, he knew about Christ, he knew about the baptism of John, but there were some gaps that needed to be filled, and we don't know what it was. Maybe it was the work of the Spirit, maybe it was the resurrection, you know, who knows, right? But they took something that was good, he was on the right track, and, and gave him uh, the equipment that he needed to uh, understand and explain the way of God more accurately. We don't have to be self-sufficient. We shouldn't be self-sufficient. It's not, it's, self-sufficiency is insufficient. Uh, and uh, we can lean on each other as we collectively seek the wisdom of God from the Spirit and through His Word. The Lord has given us other believers to, to learn from, to pour into each other. When I'm going through something, I like to, so, to talk to someone that knows the Word that loves the Lord, that I know is going to pour into me. I know some people think, oh, you know, I don't want someone to preach at me. I don't want someone, you know, to, to give me scriptures, right? But that, that's where life is, the bread of life, right? That's, the, that's, that's what uh, uh, gives us uh, fuel for our tank. We need the word of God. And that isn't to say there isn't, you know, weirdos or people that are abusive with the scripture. There's all kinds of misuses of the scripture out there, right? Uh, and that way we need to test all spirits, right? Compare scripture with scripture, grow in our understanding of the Lord, and that way we can uh, learn from one another and, and, and not have anything to do with, with spiritual pride. There's nothing spiritual about uh, being a lone wolf and how you handle scriptures. Oh, I don't need a pastor to tell me what the Bible says. I don't need, you know, so-and-so, right? You know, preaching at me or whatever else, right? There's nothing spiritual about that, right? Uh, be humble in how you receive the word. Be humble in talking to other people and, and, and letting them pour into you, right? The Lord has given us uh, people to, to, to do that, especially uh, specifically at this church. I've been super blessed by all the times that I've been ministered to uh, by those here. And so, um, are you sharing the word and are you allowing others to share the word with you? Are you allowing the word to have priority in your life or is it something that is set aside as relevant. I mean, the Ethiopian man could have said, I don't understand this, and kind of just rolled it up and, and, and kept it as a souvenir and, and never touched it, right? But that's, a, that's something that's a, a danger even for us Christians. So, uh, To continue, continue on, it says in verse 34, And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else. And, and I think it's interesting because the, the particular passage described here talks about the childlessness uh, of, of the, of the uh, suffering servant. I think that's probably something that resonated with the eunuch because he's a eunuch. He can't, uh, he can't have uh, children. So he's probably got a few questions, right? What is this? Is this about Isaiah? Is this about someone else? Is it about the nation of Israel, right? And so in verse 35, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him about the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, and they came to some water, the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So the gospel is given here, and, and that brings us to our second observation. Philip led the Ethiopian man to Jesus. Philip led him to Jesus, right? So sharing the gospel, if you don't know what that is, right, it's pointing people to Christ. And, and specifically, we see here a beautiful demonstration because Philip's presentation of the gospel is scripturally based. He doesn't take from it, right? He doesn't add to it, doesn't need anything added to it, doesn't need anything removed from it. And, and that's, a, that's a common, you know, thing nowadays, right? Oh, you know, everyone is saved and just 
believe in some concept of love or right that's not the gospel anymore right that's not that's not biblically based and and sometimes we 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 oversimplify things we'll say oh god loves you he has a plan for you right okay what does that mean right what does it mean that god loves me what does it what what plan does he have for my life right and sometimes we might just leave it at that and, and maybe you know the lord can use that and they'll search the scriptures and find something right but there's so much more to it right the fact that jesus took our sins upon himself and he died and he rose again right that is the gospel that is the bible-based gospel the world needs people who are willing to point others to jesus the the world needs people that are willing to point others to jesus our hope is not specifically in churches it's not in in pastors it's not in in bible study programs it's not in therapy doctors masks or whatever it is that that is so important to us right that we think if it was removed it we would be listless and helpless right and the world needs jesus and the world needs people to tell uh tell them about jesus do we recognize that need are we fulfilling that need in our own lives right and so the ethiopian man is baptized and it's a public declaration of his commitment to christ and what's crazy here is that culturally these two could not be any more different right you got philip he's you know jewish upbringing you know a hellenistic upbringing and now he's a christian and you've got this ethiopian man right who know you know we don't know exactly what he believed in uh, uh but he was rich he was powerful he was a eunuch now being a eunuch meant that he couldn't fully convert to Judaism. So he probably went to Jerusalem to worship, but there's those barriers there, right? Ethnically, uh, 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 socially, uh, politically probably, and also physically even, right? That because of, uh, of, of uh, his condition, and, and, and you guys know what I'm talking about, he couldn't uh, be in complete uh, uh, conversion and worship, and he probably wasn't allowed to in that way, right? And yet, these prejudices didn't stop Philip from ministering to him. All can come to Christ. As the Bible says, you know, there's neither male or female, you know, Jew or Gentile, right? Slave or free. All are one in Christ. Everyone has that need for Jesus. And so the Ethiopian man is here baptized. And to wrap things up, verse 39. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So Philip ended up in, you know, Azotus is a former city of the the Philistines. Uh, and, and again, those cultural barriers mean nothing to Philip at this point, preaches the gospel, uh, and he eventually ends up in Caesarea where he would uh live and we'll see that later on in acts and and so he he, and that's also where peter would share the gospel with cornelius the roman centurion so uh philip just shared the gospel uh wherever he went but our, our our last point is this philip's experience points us to the rapture philip's experience points to the rapture the greek word here uh let me look at it it's verse um 39 right the spirit of the lord carried philip away carried away that's the greek word uh, harpazo in the latin it's rapture right and we see that used in first thessalonians 4 for the lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of god and the dead in, in christ will rise first then those who are then we who are alive who are left will be caught up, there's that word, will caught up uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You know, same deal, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed right? And so this is a future event. It's the rapture, right? And for those of you that don't know what it is, right? We have, you know, do a study on it. We've done studies in it. Uh, uh, We've done a study through Revelation. We've done an end time study, right? It's it's the moment where the Lord takes us out of this world, right? And we meet him in the air and the seven-year tribulation begins. And and sometimes that sounds a little far-fetched. It's impossible, right? As if anything were too difficult for the Lord. I never really understood 
why people say, oh, how can that possibly happen? How can the sea part? How can a man survive in the belly of a fish for three days? How can someone be raised from the dead, right? And, and we're living in the greatest miracle of, uh, of all, at least physically, right? The creation itself. You know, he breathes creation in, in, into existence, right? He says, you know, you, know, you know, let there be light and light exists. And, and, and we have proof of it all around us, right? Nothing is, is too difficult for the Lord. And so uh, we look forward to this future event, but there's past uh, kind of similar experiences that are very uh, a type of the rapture, right? You've got, you've got Enoch, right, who didn't die. Uh, you've got Elijah, who didn't die, was taken up to be with the Lord. Uh, and you've got even here Philip, who, who was, you know, supernaturally removed from his location uh, to somewhere else where the Lord wanted him to be. He promised to return and take us to himself. And if he came the first time, he will return, right? And so we get to encourage one another with this future hope. To sort of wrap things up, we see here through Philip uh, that a life filled with the Spirit is a life that focuses on Jesus, even with the difficulty of, of, of his life, right? He's, he's probably still grieving the loss of his friend, right? Stephen brutally murdered, right, in public, right? And, and, and no justice was accomplished uh, through that, right? The, the, those who murdered him uh, believed that they were in the right. They uh, persecuted Christians, drove them out of their homes, pulled them out of their homes, right, and threw them in prison. Uh, Philip had to leave Samaria, and, or leave, uh, rather, uh, Jerusalem and go to Samaria, right? And, and uh, under this heavy persecution, under this grief, and under the threat of death and loss and loss of life, loss of, of possessions, you know, loss of livelihoods, it might have been easy for him to just say, I give up, I quit, right? And, and, and that's it for me. Uh, and yet he didn't. He, he didn't focus uh, too much on his problems, right? We can't ignore our issues. We can't ignore our problems, but there's this unhealthy focus uh, when, we, when we just dwell on it, right? When we dwell on the stuff that we're going, going uh, through and don't focus on Christ. We don't focus on Christ through his word, right? Through sharing with others and being shared with, right? The gospel and sharing with other, other people the gospel. When we don't look forward to our future hope, the fact that he's returning, that we that this, is, this life, there's more to this life than just what we see, right? But there's the future hope of the rapture. And even if we, you know, perish before then, right, we have a, 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 an eternity with Christ and an eternity with him uh, to look forward to. And yet we get so uh, uh, hyper-focused on how we feel, on, 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 what we, on what we're going through, perhaps uh, cultural differences, right? This Ethiopian man, you know, he, you know he's not going to... He's not going to uh, receive any of this, right? No, all that is set aside. Why? To glorify Christ, to focus on Jesus, uh, to be spirit-led. And to be a spirit-led individual will inevitably be the individual who focuses and hones in on the things of Jesus Christ. And what is the product of that, right? We see in the, the end of the, the, the uh, chapter, in verse 39, right, the Ethiopian the eunuch saw him no more and, and uh, went on his way rejoicing. Uh, there is a life of rejoicing that follows uh, uh, the individual who is spirit-led, the individual who uh, focuses on Jesus. When we humble ourselves and we seek Christ in his word, when we point others to Christ and vice versa, allow others to point, uh, us, point us to Jesus when we're kind of going through it right, we need that encouragement we allow others to pour into us. And, and finally, we remember, we remember our future hope. And when we do these things, when we allow these things to be an integral part of our lives, there is a rejoicing. There is a rejoicing that we cannot get from anywhere else. I love it. And I'm posting this on our stream. Write it down if uh, you missed it. There is a life of rejoicing that follows the one who walks in spirit-led ministry life of rejoicing. Are you a part of that life? Do you know this? Are you familiar with it? Are you experiencing it? It's yours. There's no one better than the rest in the church, and God is extremely clear on that, right? But there are those who just take that first step. And then it gets easier and, and better, and you just keep following those additional steps and the next one and the next one, right? 
And so to the life of Philip and the life of Peter and John and every other hero, we're going to focus in on Paul here shortly. I pray you're experiencing that life. You understand that life of rejoicing. There's nothing like it. Nothing. Amen? I tell you this, and James, why don't you come up and we'll close. Our enemy is always trying to rob us of God's best for his best things, his biggest gifts, his best blessings. We wanted to talk about the rapture today. It's right there. It's easy to do. It's the same word, for goodness sake, and it's a picture of what's coming first. This is one of God's greatest gifts to the church, the promise to come and collect and redeem what he has sealed and said that he would do that very thing, come and collect and redeem. That's your promise. That's your, wow, your legacy. Hold on to that promise. Don't let anyone take that from you. Well, I just can't really see and don't really understand when the Bible's crystal clear. I remember the days when it was a little more spoken about, and these days it's rarely even whispered about. Why is that? It's because we have a very real enemy, and he's always at work to rob us of God's biggest blessings, his best gifts, and this is one of them. This joy-filled life of serving. How can I find joy in serving somebody else? I want people to serve me. Ah, we've got chapter and verse for that. In fact, that's when Jesus says you'll find your life when you lay it down, when you start to serve other people and die to yourself. Let me tell you, there's a life of rejoicing, a hidden joy. You've got to step out in faith. It's a requirement, that first step. And then you'll see, and you'll know, and you'll have it too. God help us to do that. Where did things go from here, Andy, with this Ethiopian dude? I don't know, ask him in heaven, right? <laughs> But we know this, God's faithful. And I can't wait to hear all the stories and see all the good work that God did. One person, one person, one soul was so precious to our Lord. And I love that. Why don't we pray? Lord Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful that you have taken the time to talk to us today. Thank you for teachers, Lord. You say it's a spiritual gift, and most pastors are. Not all have to be. Opening up the Word, simplifying it, making it as simple as possible so everyone can understand. Giving clear, solid biblical instruction so your people can know and so they can grow. Thank you for this time. Thank you for speaking to us today. Lord, help us to act on, to do all the things that you've told us to do today. You warn us, Lord, against hearing and not doing. You talk to us, God, about being lukewarm, and that is the hot and the cold are both pouring in, but it leads to no real good, no real difference, no real change. Convict us, Lord. God, help us to crank off, turn off, Maybe the inlets of cold that are coming into our hearts and our lives so the word can dwell in us richly, producing all the good fruit that you intend it to. Lord, raise us up as a people equipped to live and serve in these last days. These are crazy times, Lord. Crazy times. We need each other more than ever. And yet our enemy is trying to rob us of intimacy and of fellowship. Tempting us to fight about everything, be divided over everything. Losing our focus and our strength and our power. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as you forgive us. Help us to be gracious to each other. Help us to fight for, as you tell us to, to strive to maintain our unity in the body of Christ. And our unity is, is in you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We commit, Lord, our brothers and sisters, our precious kids to you. 
and pray you help us to work all these things out in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. One more thing before we go today. I want to remind you again, and I feel pressed by the Lord to do this. There is a lot going on in our country, in our culture. However that's impacting you, would you please remember that your pastors are here for you. That the Lord commands us to shepherd over the flock of God. That means more than just teach you the Bible. That's part of what we do. But a shepherd does a whole lot of things, don't they? That is our calling. That is the office the Lord has given us and the authority that he's given us as well. If you are questioning, wondering, worrying, overwhelmed, just come. And we are so very privileged to lead you to the Lord and open up his word and provide Holy Spirit-inspired counsel. If we have something to say for God, we'll tell you. If he doesn't have anything to say, we'll tell you that too. And we'll just pray for you. Uh, But we're here for you. If that's you, don't just leave. Um, Don't just get on the internet or ask Joe, Sally at work or whatever, right? Let's seek the Lord together about all the things that we're going through. Let's find his wisdom and let's benefit from that. Amen? And then lastly, just one more thing. In these last days, and I feel very strongly um, about this this morning, we're going to continue to see things change in our country. So I will tell you this. Build the kind of church that you want to be a part of. It's on you. It's not on us. If you have suggestions for us, hey, notice there's no suggestion box, but... We'll, we'll try to take them. We'll take them to the Lord and see what he says. But for mostly, it's your participation. You want a weak church? Don't participate. You want a strong church? And in these last days, folks, we're going to need it. Do you want your kids to have a strong church, a healthy church, a place where they can continue on and grow? Then that's on you and that's on me. And so as much as we want a strong church, would you be a strong church? Would you serve and share and give accordingly? Tides aren't low, don't worry, that's not my point. Right? The main point is participation. Amen? It it is what you make it. We'll be faithful either way. We love you, God bless you. Come, the prayer team's coming up. We're going to be here longer than you will. We don't leave till you do. So, so come up and get some prayer if that's you. If not, make sure you fellowship. Introduce yourself. Share with one another before you go. We love you. God bless you.